Welcome, you're watching The Real Medvine and this video is going to be geared towards not people that usually watch the videos I make in this channel, but rather people that are specifically interested in this topic. So hello, I'm David. I am an Orthodox Christian apologist and I am at the very least nationality wise a Turkish Orthodox Christian. And here I, I will make a presentation to you on the history of Turkish Christians and before I start I want to kind of make a small little small amount of comments uh, I, I don't want to keep it too long because usually I just love talking about things off topic but Turkish Christian seems sounds like an oxymoron it sounds like something we can't even imagine it just sounds strange it sounds weird it sounds like something that never usually happens um, I am not a stigma breaker, but one of the stigmas that we have in the world today is that if you're a set ethnicity, you have to follow this religion that you're born in or this kind of presupposition. I don't think that's true. If you're going to follow a religion, first of all, that religion, you really have to believe it to be true. You really have to, at the very least, try to know it, try to learn about it. And, you know, if you're, if you're Turkish and you're Christian, you're no less Christian than a Greek Christian. You should never be considered as a less, less of a Christian because this is a religion of the converts, man. It's, <laughs> I mean, what can I say? So what I'm going to be covering in this video is going to be the history of Turkish nations, um, certain important Turkish Christians in history that we don't really hear much about. But once we learn about them, some of the things that you're going to find out, find out is going to be surprising. And finally, I'm going to be covering the lives of the saints, of certain Turkish saints. All of the uh, the lives of the saints that I'm going to be covering are going to be Orthodox Christian saints. Some of the Christian Turks I'm going to be covering are not Orthodox. Some of them are Roman Catholic. Some of them are Church of the East. But um, as I'm Orthodox Christian, obviously this video has a Orthodox Christian bent. But also at the same time, Christian Turks have mostly been Orthodox at the same time. So I don't like doing this in my videos um, for, you know, just personal reasons. I don't like starting videos with prayer. Um, it's just um, not something that I like, I, like, I like doing, like for the video. But in this case, I will make an exception because here we have the Lord's Prayer in Kuman Turkish and in Modern Turkish. Now, the Modern Turkish translation is not exactly the way you will say it in Modern Turkish. The way you will say the Lord's Prayer in Modern Turkish is pretty different, actually. But it still utilizes Turkish words. It's made to be similar with the Kuman Turkish version. So this is from Codex Kumanicus. It's the Lord's Prayer in Kuman Turkish and Modern Turkish. And I just want to start this video by reading the Modern Turkish version because I don't think I can read the command well what I, i'm going to be what i'm whatever i'm going to be reading is going to be sounding similar anyway so i want to just start with that and if you want to go along you can just type on google get your bible read the lowest prayer and then we can start this video so uh, i'll start atamız ki göktesin alkışlı olsun senin adın gelsin senin hanlığın olsun senin dilemeyin nice ki gökte öyle de öyle de yerde gündelik ekmeğimizi bize bugün ver Dahi yazıklarımızı bize boşat. Nice biz boşatırız bize yaman kötülük edenleri. Dahi şeytanın sınamağını bizi koyurma. Tüm yamandan bizi kurtar. Amin. I pretty much butchered it because it genuinely is kind of strange in modern Turkish. But we start this video off very well. Now let's look at the things that I'm going to be covering here in this video. As I've said in the beginning, we're going to be looking at the brief history of Turkish Christian people groups. Um... Then we're going to be looking at the three big Turkish theologians that I want to cover and also the Turkish saints in the Orthodox Church. And before I start, I, I should have actually mentioned this at the beginning. I'm very sorry, but a lot of the stuff in this video, in this presentation, is from Mark Madrigal's book on Turkish Christians. The book is in Turkish. So a lot of the stuff in here, a lot of them are translated from me and a lot of them i just looked into it found the english versions of it because why why am i going to add up more work to myself right but um the book is in turkish if you know turkish i will invite you to read it the book has a kind of like a research sources cited page at the end of it so a lot of this is cited in that book um 
so we're not really pulling stuff out of nowhere. Some of the stuff that I'm going to be introducing, some of the information I'm going to be introducing is stuff that is not per se covered in the book, but elsewhere. And most of the time I'll indicate it in the video. You will see it in, in the presentation. I've already talked way too long. Let's actually begin this video properly by talking about the Turkish people groups that were Christian. I'm going to be starting with Kuman Christians. Uh, these Kuman Christians... Uh, I'm specifically talking about those who settled near Hungary due uh, uh, in the 13th century. And um, and due to the efforts of the Dominican missionaries, they converted to Roman Catholic Christianity, especially after the baptism of one of the Kuman chieftains, Bortz. Uh, and this led to the establishment of the... Uh, Kuman diocese, uh, the Roman Catholic diocese of Kumania, it, you know, really helped establish a Ra Roman Catholic diocese specifically for a Turkish people group. Robert, the Archbishop of Estergom, who baptized Bortz, uh, ordains Theodoric as the Bishop of Kumania, and this diocese becomes established. Unfortunately, this diocese is very, very, very short-lived. It survived for like 15, 16 years. And the reason is because of the Mongol invasion. The Mongol invasions really did a huge number of Kuman people in general, not just Kuman Christians, but Kuman people in general, where a lot of them were enslaved, a lot of them were just massacred, and some of them lived in the Mongol Empire, still as Christians, retaining their religious identity, but um, this basically made the diocese pretty much it over time vanished. It, even in the 14th century, you still had certain people with the title of Bishop of Kumaya, but it didn't really have any effective authority at that stage because the jurisdiction it was um, handling, let's say, just genuinely did not have anyone. And it is quite unfortunate, but I wanted to start off with that. We have stronger uh, examples here. The Chuvash Turks. The Chuvash Turks are native to an area stretching from the Volga region to Siberia, and most of them live in the Republic of Chuvashia, which is in the Russian Federation. So it's one of the uh, republics in Russia today. There are around 1.5 million Chuvash Turks, and today more than 65% of them are Orthodox Christians. Uh, the rest of them aren't just Muslims. Some of them are of are different kinds of Christians. Some of them are atheists. Very few of them are Muslims. So a huge chunk of the Chuvash Turks are Orthodox Christians. And the process of their um, conversion really started in the 18th century. In, in 1769, the Russian missionaries translated the Bible to Chuvashian. I'm, I say Chuvashian, but I don't know <laughs> to say it in English. But in Chuvash Turkish, I think that's the better way to say it. And they also wrote a book on Chuvash grammar. So this kind of resembles what happened with the conversion of the Slavs. Now with the conversion of the Slavs, you had this the Cyrillic alphabet, right? But generally, it, typically in these conversions, you not only just have missionaries sent there, but they even just kind of make grammar books, help them establish their grammar, help them establish their alphabet better, help them understand their own culture better. And you know, also convert them to Christianity. This in, in turn increases literacy, right? Because you see more Chuvash uh, Turks, you know, learning how to read, learning their own, uh, learning to read in their own language and whatnot. And these efforts have lasted for a pretty long time. You, for example, in 1836, uh, from the, from due to the initiative efforts of Kazan University, uh, you had other uh, grammar books being produced. And over time, this helped the evangelization of orthodoxy to the Chuvash Turks um, in that region, and which is most likely why they're still today orthodox Christians. The Gagauz Turks are, for a very long time, have been orthodox. Um, I believe, if I'm not wrong, I believe since 11th or 12th century, don't quote me on that, but for a particularly long time, the Gagauz Turks were Orthodox Christians. The Gagauzia is at the moment a nation within Molda Moldova. It used to be nicknamed the Guard Unit of the Byzantine Empire. And although they, they preserved their Turkish identity for centuries, they also preserved their religious identity, even under the Ottomans. So the Gagauz Turks, again, to, to still today are Orthodox Christians. And 
huge majority of them are. And today there are 3,000, 300,000 Gagos Turks still living today. And I also want to say, just anecdotally speaking, um, the church I used to go to when I lived in Istanbul, now I'm not in Istanbul anymore because of uh, the chunky virus, you know, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not in Istanbul, right? I'm somewhere else in Turkey right now. But uh, the church I went to, I mean, I've known a couple of Gagos Turks there. And um, so I have personal experience firsthand with uh, Gagos Turks. The other Turkish groups, gr uh, Turkish people group that was Christian were the Yakuts. The Yakuts um, also live in Russia. Uh, most of them are living in today's Yakutia. This is, I believe, Far East Russia. Um, and for again, for a pretty long time, their relationship with Christianity was non-existent, not because they were not receptive to it per se, but rather due to their politics against, uh, due to Russian politics. A lot of Russian politics um, were happening in the 17th century, but by 1820s, most Yakuts were members of the Russian Orthodox Church. So most of them uh, did indeed convert, uh, where they become majority Orthodox. And today, Yakuts are still converting to Orthodox Christianity. I'm saying still because, you know, the effects of the Soviet menace have done a lot of damage to Christianity in Russia in general. So for some people groups, it has done severe amounts of damage. For some other people groups, it hasn't really done that much. The Yakuts were one of those people, I will say, I this is more speculatory. Um, again, I am not a master pro-historian, uh, but to my knowledge, this is really what happened. This is what will explain why there you still you see Yakuts, Yakut Turks converted to Orthodox Christianity. This is from an article from Orthodox uh, Christianity uh, .net, I believe, and all of the Sources, by the way, I'm going to be putting in the description below if you want to check them out for yourself. So I'm not going to leave the description box empty. It takes a lot of effort. Um, honestly, I dread doing this, but, you know, you have to do, you have to prove what you're saying. So this is from one of the interviews uh, that were done from Bishop Roman of Yakutsk. Uh, he said this in an interview. He says, the number of ethnic Yakut faithful is increasing noticeably, which makes me very happy. For this, we have translated one of the main services, the liturgy, into Yakut. For over a year, we have celebrated the liturgy in Yakut every Sunday. So this is another thing in Orthodox Christianity is that vernacular liturgy is a thing. Now, um, it doesn't instantaneously happen. This is a, this is something that takes time. So, for example, unfortunately, in, in Turkey, a huge majority, outside of one Orthodox church that does it every month, all of the churches do their, do their liturgy in either in Greek or in Slavonic, but it's not an instantaneous thing. But shifting the language of liturgy to the vernacular is something that is generally something that happens eventually, right? So this is the case with the Yakut Turks. They have their liturgy translated into their own language. The liturgy in Yakut is served in Vernevilyusk, Vilyusk, and Sunt I can't say it in Russian, so I'm not Russian. Noted Vladika Roman. The bishop stated that in Yakutia there are 67 registered Orthodox communities. There are not actual church buildings everywhere. In some places, the communities rent separate quarters or even an apartment in an apartment complex. But 67 communities is a fair lar fairly large number, said Bishop Roman. He added that in the diocese of Yakutia there are two monasteries, one male and one female. In our Holy Protection Convent, which has existed for 15 years, there are 12 nuns headed by the abbess. In the monastery, which was officially opened in October of last year, there are six priests and monks, three higher monks and three novices. Life is only just beginning and being restored, he noted. According to Vladika, the construction of churches in Yakutia will continue. We will strengthen the liturgical life, and through this, we will intensify social activities aimed at helping the sick, the abandoned, and the lonely. For a parish is not only a place of prayer, but also a place of widely applied sacrificial love, care, and attention. In March, we will hold the Third Congress of Orthodox Youth, related Bishop Rahman. So even still today, again, still today, you, ha you have several Turkish peoples, Turkic people, whatever you want to call them, Turkish peoples, that are participating in an Orthodox Christian life. So this should already give you some idea of the relationship Turkish people generally have with orthodoxy but 
let's kind of get to the real thing. Let's, you know, when we speak of Turkey, most people don't think of Central Asians. Most people don't think of the Turks in Russia or whatever. They're thinking about the Turks living in Turkey. That's what they're mainly thinking about, right? So an example of Turks living in Turkey, and again, you can debate the ethnography of the Karamanlis and whatever, uh, but culturally speaking, look, let's uh, let's be real. If the Karamanlılar were um, Muslim, everyone will just say they were Turkish, okay? The only thing stopping them from saying they're not, they're uh, Turkish in, in that scenario is because they're Christian, okay? Let's, let's cut to the chase. Culturally-wise, at the very least, they are Greek-Turkish syncretic, okay? But the Karamanlidis, the Karamanlılar, uh, were Turkish-speaking Orthodox people living in Anatolia um, until the Turkish-Greek population exchange in 1923. Uh, they spoke... Now, in bottom right, you see a tombstone, and you might think, oh, this is Greek. This is Greek, man. This is Greek. It is... Yes, the letters are Greek. It's in Hellenic script, but it's actually in Turkish. And uh, it starts with, Bu mezarda sakin nide... Um, I'm, I can't read long Greek stuff, but I can read the uh, last end. It's uh, the, the last part, not the last section, but above the last section, it says, Yatıyor, uh, punctuation, Allah rahmet eylesin, 1897, uh, Julius, which I believe this is July, so July 21st, 1897. This is uh, for the person that's dead. I can't, I can't read it in full. I can read some parts of it, but not some parts. I have difficulty, but you get the idea. This is Greek letter, but it's Turkish. It's saying it in Turkish. Uh, so that's something really particularly interesting about the Karamanlılar is like until that, like when they lived there is, is, is that. I, I just think that's completely fascinating. As I said, they were majority Orthodox. One of the saints, Turkish saints that I'm going to be talking about is a Karamanlı. And um, the, the thing about the population exchange, the crazy thing about the population exchange is that you might ask yourself, wait, if these people are Turkish, why were they exchanged from Turkey to Greece? The thing with the population exchange it is that the population exchange was not based on ethnicity, but it was based on religion. So you had Turkish Christians being sent to Greece and you had Greek Muslims being sent to Turkey. And as you can see, that is a kind of a strange situation, but that is how it was done in 1923, uh, the Greek populate the Greek Turkish population exchange. And um, some of them were Gagos Turks. Again, some of them were actual Turk people, people that considered themselves Turks, but as Turks, but they were sent because they were Christian. And as you know, most likely for normal people, this is obviously this doesn't really make much sense, but you know, you can defend it by saying. It, you know, they just had to find a way and this is the best possible way they found it. So I'm not really going to get too much into it. But that will, in a, in a basic sense, conclude the Turkish Christian people groups. Now let's get to the section of the three big Turkish theologians um, that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about Rabban Bar Soma. Now, this guy is very very interesting to say the least his his life story is very interesting what i'm going to be telling here is a summary of that you can make your own research but rabban barsama is an ungut turk um, he lived in far far east basically i believe in today's china again uh, i'm not a hyper beast when it comes to far eastern geography so forgive me but uh, he was an ambassador of the ilhanet and um ilhanet i didn't even say it properly and even in turkish ilhanet uh, he lived in Marco Polo's time. He's basically the Turkish Marco Polo. Marco Polo, who traveled, um, uh, he he traveled. No, no. Rabban Barsama traveled from China to France and tried to travel back to China. He died on his way in in Baghdad, I believe. Uh, but he traveled from China, today's China, to France. So he's basically kind of like a reverse Marco Polo. And um, the most likely theory about his origin it, is that he's an Ungut Turk uh, from Salma. 
he became a monk at the age of 23 and he lived in his monastery cell for seven years. He was very highly respected as a theologian, as a spiritual father, as someone that you can get your theological and spiritual advice from. So he is a very big deal at the time. He was a teacher of a certain Marcus for three years and this Marcus became the patriarch of the Church of the East. So he even was influential in one of the patriarchs of the Church of the East. And the, 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 this and Rabban Bar Soma engaged on his journey due to being convinced by this future patriarch uh, to start their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And what started as a, as a long pilgrimage to Jerusalem became a legendary tale. And so here is a map of the voyages of Rabban Bar Soma. You can see uh, it starts from Pekin, uh, Rabban Bar Soma and Rabban Mark leave for Jerusalem and they make their way to uh, Jer Jerusalem and I believe and what we see here is that in, in uh, 1287 he starts to move further west he starts to move to Constantinople he meets, the, he meets with the Byzantine Emperor he moves to Rome he uh, meets with, uh, uh, with the Roman Pope I believe he visits Rome again. It, I don't know if it's in the first visit or if it's in the second. No, it, uh, he. Oh, it's. I believe it's in the second visit because it's with the Pope Nicholas. But Pope Nicholas really liked him. He was very interested, and he even managed to celebrate his own liturgy in his own right in Rome. Um, I believe during Lent. Maybe even Easter. I'm not 100% sure, but the details are on Wikipedia. You can go check that out. I'm just kind of giving you the basic info here. But um, he, in his travels back in 1294, he died in Baghdad. But this is, again, this is a legendary tale. I mean, a Turkish Christian, Marco Polo, you'd think someone like that will be all over the history books. But, you know... If I didn't tell you about this, and if I didn't read it from Mark Madrigal's book on Turkish Christians, none of us will have any idea who this person even was. I think this is just insane. I mean, we should, we should have known about this guy at least once in our lifetimes. Not from this YouTube video, not from a rare book, but from our school. But, you know, that's how education works nowadays, right? Um but again, that's Rabban Bar Sama for you. Very influential Turkish uh, Church of the East theologian. And for those who don't know, Church of the East, the Church of the East is also known as the Nestorian Church. They're a church uh, who accept the first and the second ecumenical council. They schismed due to the third ecumenical council, which is the Council of Ephesus in 431. They hold to a Nestorian um, strict diophysite Christology. Uh where there is this kind of dual subject in Christ. That is the Christological position they held. And the Church of the East evangelized for a pretty long time. Really, I believe, until the Seljuk Turks. Um, they had a lot of influence in Persia. They had a lot of influence in um, some parts of China and parts of the Far East. So they were an existing church. Uh, at those times as well, during those times as well. Another Turkish Christian that I'm going to be talking about is Simon Osman. Uh, his Italian name is Simon Ottomano. Ottomano just means Ottoman and Osman means Ottoman. So his name is Simon Osman. He was born between 1310 or 1318. By uh, He was born from a Turkish Ottoman father and a Roman that is a Greek mother. So as a child, he was Greek Orthodox. Um, and he studied at the Studium Monastery as an Orthodox Christian, and he became multilingual, multilingual due to his studies. He, became, he knew Turkish, he knew Greek, he knew Hebrew, and he knew Latin perfectly. So he could speak four languages, even at that time. I mean, speaking four languages, those languages especially, that's crazy, even today. Um, at that time, that's even crazier. Uh, and today, unfortunately, the Studium Monastery is now a mosque, unfortunately, but um, that's where he studied. And, uh, of course, I as an Orthodox Christian, I'm not happy that this happened, but he, unfortunately, 
apostatized from Orthodoxy and became a Roman Catholic because he sided with Barlaam of Calabria over the Hesychast controversy. I am really not going to go into details, uh, detail but I have videos covering this, kind of, kind of covering this issue. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this, uh, what the Hesychast controversy is, but it is something that happened in the 14th century. If you're interested, there are sources you can check out from uh, Jay. He talks about Jay Dyer, he talks about this. But he became a Roman Catholic. He became, I believe, a Roman Catholic bishop even. Um, he, became, he was also a citizen of Republic of Venice. And he was considered as a, as a great scholar in his lifetime. By Some consider him as, you know, even as a saintly man. Um, he was appointed as a bishop of Geras in Calabria after the death of Barleum of Calabria in, uh, until 1366. Uh, he gave Greek lessons uh, in Avignon to the to the Pope and to others in 1360s. He was appointed as a bishop of Thebes in Athens in 1366 until 1379. And at this time, this duchy was owned by the Catalans. And this meant that Simon had uh, not only ecclesiastical issues to worry about, but now he had to worry about geopolitical and uh, mil military issues. And he really did not try to, you know, get too much into that. And um, because and do, at, the, at the same time, at that time, you had in the West, the Western schism, the Avignon papacy and whatnot. And certain people were separated into, into different camp. He sided with Rome when the Catalans sided with the Avignon papacy, uh, which caused the Catalans to, you know, dislike him. They didn't like him because of that. And so, although you have a lot of people saying that he's a saintly person, you also have certain Catalans saying this guy is a this guy is a POS. This guy's a terrible person. Uh, most likely, this is because of geopolitical uh, reasons. And after the Navarran invasion, Simon moved to Rome uh, to teach Hebrew, Greek, and Latin in Rome. His scholarship is extensive, but we don't have every single piece of his scholarship today. He made a side-by-side -side translation of the Old Testament uh, consisting of the Hebrew, Greek, and Latin translations all in one book. And he gifted this to Pope Urban VI. Today, this book can be found in Biblioteca Centrale uh, Marciana in Venice. Uh, so you can find it there. Obviously, you can't buy it, probably, but you can find it there. And he also translated Plutarch's Uncontrolling Anger to Latin. No doubt he has produced other works. It's just, we just don't have them today. Uh, probably. That's probably the case. Reg something that regularly happens. And if you're interested in the life of Simon Osman, I can recommend two works. One is in Italian. The other is in English. The Papes and the Levant by Kenneth uh, Seton uh, has a section talking about Simon Osman. Another book is specifically on him. It is by Giorgio Fedalto, Simona Atemano, Monaco di Studio, Archivescovo, Latino di Tebe. I hope I didn't butcher the Italian. You can go check that out if you know Italian, that is. Uh, now, let us talk about the great schema monk Nicholas. This is a Orthodox uh, theologian that I'm going to be talking about. He was born in 1828 in Bitlis as a Muslim Turk. He was a pasha and a general of the Turkish guards during the war between the Ottomans and the Russians. And he, at that time, was responsible for torturing a lot of Christians, you know, Russian Christians, not because they were Christians, but, you know, they were Russian war captives, I, I suppose, uh, during the war. And what made him interest interested, because in, uh, I say Yusuf here, because uh, in Russian records, his name is Yusuf Amtnol Ogli, it's written in Russian. Ogli is Olu. Amtnol, I don't know what that's supposed to mean in Turkish. Uh, maybe I'm just silly. Uh, but uh, that is what is recorded as in Russian in, in Russian records. And the strength of the Christians, while they were being persecuted and tortured, interested him. It interested Yusuf Pasha to the point of making him study and research Orthodox Christianity, it interested him. He looked at the struggles and he said, I, I want to know why, like, why do these people suffer so much torture and they just take it, like, take it in joy and they're happy about it. Like, 
these people must be crazy. I got to study these people. And over time, while he was studying Orthodox Christianity, he eventually came to the conclusion that the Orthodox faith is the true faith, and he became Orthodox Christian. And after his conversion, he was reported to the authorities by his own father when he came back as a baptized Orthodox Christian. Um, he, As a result, he tried to escape to Iran in 1874, but he failed in doing so and was caught. And, you know, he was caught basically betraying the Islamic faith in the eyes of the authorities. So he was tortured. He was beaten near to death. The beatings... I don't want. I, I haven't even detailed them here. They were pretty, pretty harsh. I mean, the um, he was not in a good shape. He was near death, but he he stayed alive. He managed to stay alive, and he escaped to Russia. And over time, he became a schema monk and died as one. Now, you might have a question: What the heck is a schema monk? What are you talking about? A schema monk, and this is from Orthodox Wiki, a schema monk is a rare step taken in monastic life and is seldom approved by the abbot or bishop. The schema goes beyond carrying the cross of Christ. Like our Lord Jesus Christ, he must be willing to surrender his life to totally save people's souls. He must, in fact, be willing to be nailed to the cross he has been carrying. The schema monk is, in essence, an elder among the monastic community. He's the highest, right? He's a monk who has aspired to a spiritual level that transcends worldly desires. It is a life of constant prayer. He's a walking icon of our Lord Jesus Christ. A schema monk is sought after by religious of all ranks, monastic and lay people for spiritual advice and comfort, as well as other spiritual and religious matters. The schema monk will again take a new name in Christ to show he has totally given up his world life. So, a schema monk, not anyone can be one. Okay, it's he's he's the highest ranked monastic, um, and you see in this picture, you these are two schema monks. What they're wearing is what uh, is the schema, the great schema. Uh, only schema monks can wear it. Unfortunately, some people put this in the market as as a hoodie. Um, I know people who do that, and I, you know, they don't have bad intentions, but you know, it's kind of a serious deal. It's a big deal. We can't just commercialize this kind of this kind of stuff. But this is what a schema monk is. So, uh, schema monk Nicholas. This is what he became. And here is a life of uh, schema monk Nicholas uh, from a website Orthodox England. Um, Yusuf Oulu was born in Asia Minor in 1827 or 1828. He became a Pasha and general in the Turkish Guards. During the war between the Turks and the Russians, he commanded the Turkish army. The Turks were fanatics and tortured the Russian prisoners. The Pasha will, will watch these tortures and amazed at the steadfastness of these Christians. He will question the soldiers as to why they were dying so joyfully. He decided to become better acquainted with the Orthodox faith. In 1874, he secretly summoned an Orthodox priest, was baptized, and tried to leave for Persia. When the Turks learned of his betrayal of Islam, they caught him and carved crosses in the skin of his chest and back and broke his bones. The Pasha lost consciousness. Thinking that he was dead, the Turks threw him to dogs to be torn apart, but God preserved him. He regained consciousness, thanking God, whom he loved with his whole heart. Passing Russian merchants picked Yusuf up. He told them that thieves had fallen on him, robbed him, and beaten him. Out of compassion, the merchants took, took him to the Caucasus and gave him to a woman so that he could be taken care of. Yusuf recovered but was unrec unrecognizable. He was bent over as an old man who walked with a stick, dressed poorly but had a rich soul, endowed with spiritual power. He succeeded in crossing from the Caucasus to Odessa and until 1891 lived much in Kazan, but also went on pilgrim pilgrimages to the holy places of Russia. Once setting out for Moscow, he found himself in Optina, which he had heard of through the fame of the Optina elder, St. Ambrose. He liked it very much there, but unexpectedly fell ill and was placed in the monastery infirmary. As he spoke very poor Russian, he asked if anyone spoke French. The French-speaking elder Barsanufius, who himself had been a colonel in the Russian army and had served in Kazan before becoming a monk, was summoned to confess the sick pilgrim. By the way, there were Ottoman Turks, especially at that time, Ottoman Turks speaking uh, French and these different languages was not uncommon, like high-positioned pashas. It, it wasn't really uncommon, so 
it's not crazy that he knows French. There were it. It was common enough where it wasn't crazy f- to find out a Turk speaking French, right? Just wanted to make that note here. The Turk recounted his life to the elder, but forbade him to reveal his secret while he was alive. During his illness, he was tonsured under the name Nicholas, taking the schema. However, he recovered and settled in the skit. Once taking a walk with him, he suddenly said, Father, can you hear the angelic music? It is a great happiness to hear it. The elder heard nothing, and Father Nicholas, in his simplicity, was amazed at his deafness. Indeed, this simple monk was carried up to heaven during his earthly life. He saw the abodes of paradise and heard heavenly music. This we know of, of from the following event. By the way, when he says he was carried up to heaven, it's not saying that he just like teleported, like just flew to heaven. <laughs> it's not saying that, but it's talking about like spiritually speaking that his mindset has ascended to heaven. That's what it's referring to. His noose, his eye of the soul, his soul has ascended into heaven in, in terms of knowledge, in terms of the state of its of his soul and whatnot. Father Nicholas was always shy and silent, a sickly man who avoided everyone. Although the monks all somehow involuntarily loved him, he never went to anyone's cell, even in the daytime, let alone at night. One night, however, he came to Elder Barsanufius's cell. According to Father Barsanufius, another elder, Father Anatoly, had already summoned him and warned him, Did you know that in our skit, by the great mercy of God, we have our own Saint Andrew, the fool for Christ? Yes, we have such a man here, who, whether in the body or out of the body, God knows, was even during his life taken up into the heavenly habitations. This is our Turk. I will bless him to come to your cell, and you question him thoroughly, and write down from his words what you learned from him. Only keep all this secret until his death. So, Saint uh, Schema Monk Nicholas, which I mean, in my view, he's a saint. Uh, in his life, he was considered so highly that his life was compared to Saint Andrew the Fool for Christ. But there's more to this. So the servant of God came to Father Barsanufius as an obedience. In his broken Russian, he revealed his tale of the heavenly dwelling places which had been shown to him by his guardian angel. The elder's heart trembled from the superhuman flood of the ineffable joy of triumphant fulfilled hope. The discourse poured from Father Nicholas's lips and his face shone and shone until it began to glow with some kind of extraordinary inward light. The elder was awestruck and terrified and in an unearthly way joyful. According to Elder Barsanufius, everything that Father Nicholas told him can be found in the life of St. Andrew the Fool for Christ. For the elder, the only thing that was important was the sight of Father Nicholas's infinite exaltation and the glory which was imprinted on his glowing face. Only a true seer of mysteries could speak like that. With a voice breaking from indescribable excitement, from time to time he could only beg him to continue not to fall silent, not to fall silent. Father Nicholas finally ended, merely adding with a radiant, blessed smile. Well, what else do you want to know? What else is there to learn? The time will come and you'll see for yourself. What else could I tell you or how could I tell you? There are just no words in human language with which to convey what goes on there. You know, there were colors I saw there that don't even exist on earth. How can I convey all that to you? But listen to what I'll tell you. You know, after all, what good music is. Let's say I've heard something, and as soon as I've heard it, it resounds in my ears. It sings in my heart, and I continue to hear it. But you haven't heard it. How then, with what words, could I tell you about it, so that by my words you could hear it and delight in it with me? You just can't. In the same way, what I saw there is impossible to convey to man. The fact that this is the way it is shall be enough for you. Schema Monk Nicholas reposed at Optina three months later. Two years after first going there, this was on 18th of August, 1893, and he was aged 65. Only after his death did Father Anopheli reveal to the monks what sort of man he had been saying, Don't think that this was a mere mortal. A mere mortal is not given such mercy from God. Father Nicholas was a martyr for the name of Christ and for confessing his holy name. When he was being washed up after his repose, his whole body was seen to be lined with, a, with terrible scars. In his homeland, in Turkey, 
they had sliced his flesh with tongs as a result of his conversion to Christ, trying to force him to renounce him. He did not renounce him, and with God's help escaped further sufferings from the hands of the torturers. Elder Ambrose of Optina, whom Nicholas had found due to his fame throughout Russia, sent him to us, to Optina. This was written by Father Andrew. You can read it from orthodoxengland.org.uk. Now, if you have never read Lives of the Saints before, uh, please don't get too hung up by the fantastical writings in, in here. I'm not going to say they're fake. Um, I will not say that. I'm not going to disbelieve the lies of amazing people like that. But uh, this... I, I do understand it's a completely different way of thinking. Um, we are going to see this kind of thinking, this, these kinds of stories from the other saints that we're going to be talking about further on in this video. This is not specific to Turkish saints, by the way. You will see a lot of the lies of the saints. A lot of it, well, we have to look at it from scripturally as well first. Um, St. Paul says, in one of his epistles, that imitate me as I imitate Christ. And what this means is that the lives of a saint, the life of a saint is a, the life of Christ. It's a continuation of the life of Christ. What St. Paul says by saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ, is that you should imitate people like him uh, who imitate Christ by imitating people like St. Paul, by imitating people like these saints, we in turn imitate Christ and we try to live the life of Christ as much as we possible, as much as we possibly can. So, um, again, uh, although he's not a canonized saint, I feel very comfortable naming Saint Nicholas as a saint. Um, it's kind of nuanced, but many people have been venerated as saints before they were officially canonized. Um, so there's that, and and Elder Elder Nicholas Kemamak Nicholas, uh, a huge aspect that we're going to be seeing in in this video about the lives of the saints is that they suffered for their faith, and this is a very consistent theme. This is something that consistently happened. They suffered for their faith, and Saint Nicholas suffered for his faith, and. <clears throat> uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is that a lot of people can feel get this temptation of saying, oh, the Turks are oppressing us. Oh, they're doing this, they're doing that. I want to say this. If you have read the lives of the saints, it's not just Turks that persecute Christians. Everyone, including Christian people, have persecuted Christians. The Byzantine Empire, the greatest Christian nation empire that has ever existed, and that will ever exist, have persecuted Christians, even as a Christian nation. Russia has persecuted Christians, even as a, uh, as a Christian nation. So, it's pointless to get into this whole thing, all oh, Turks persecuted. Blessed are those that are persecuted. This is a promise from the scriptures. It's going to happen. This persecution can be a small persecution, or this can be a violent type of persecution. It's just going to happen. It's just a aspect of life that's going to happen. I just want to make note of that as I move on. Now I want to move on to the Turkish Orthodox saints. Uh, these are these all of these saints are in the Orthodox Church. They're in the Orthodox liturgical calendar. They're venerated as saints in the Orthodox Church. Um, so these are all canonized saints. But what is a what is a saint in the first place? A saint, in the most basic sense, is uh, is someone in heaven. Now, in the context of ecclesiastical and religious understanding, which is what we are going to be operating with, a saint is someone who is particularly holy, beyond doubt, who exhibits a holy life that the church officially, infallibly recognizes and understands as a saint. So when a saint is canonized, that doesn't mean that he gets transported to heaven because he's canonized. No, the church is just recognizing that he is someone that is particularly holy, that he is someone that is in heaven, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of course, and we consider these people as saints. We consider these people as uh, holy people that we should imitate in order to imitate Christ, right? So this is what a saint is in the Orthodox understanding, and these 
people that we're going to be looking at, these Turkish Orthodox saints, are those very people that we should be imitating. So here are some of the citations that uh, the book provides, the, the Mark Madrigal book provides on, on the lives of the saints. Uh, Witnesses for Christ, Orthodox Christian neo martyrs of the Ottoman period, Dr. Vaporis from St. Vladimir Seminary, uh, Konstantinos Dokas, Mega Synaxaritis, Perantonis' uh, Lexicon Neo Martyron, and Kemen Zedis' uh, Synaxaristis Neo Martyron. All of these are citations used by him. Um, and let us move with the first one St. Tuna de Imran. Before I move on, um, now, there, people are inevitably going to debate about the ethnicity of X, Y, Z person. So, for for example, it's Saint Tuna. People are going to say he's an Arab Emir. Um, I add, I, I start with him here because there is there a possibility? Yes. Is there a possibility that he's also just a Turk? Yes. And I think the possibility that he's a Turk is much more likely. Than him being Arab, in my personal opinion, which is why I've added him here. Uh, one of the saints I did not add that is in the book is Saint uh, John of Konitsa, and that is because he's Albanian. I mean, by all counts, the evidence points to him being an Albanian, so I just didn't I just didn't add him in this video. But Saint Tuna, Saint Tunam the Emir, uh, I want to talk I want to talk about his life. His feast day is April 18th, and he converted to Orthodox in uh, 1614 during Pascha. Uh, this is Easter, right? And he converted, and his conversion is due to the Holy Fire miracle, which I am going to be talking about later on. And um, he, when when his compatriots found out about his conversion to Orthodoxy, he was tortured for his faith, and he died as a result. And because he was tortured and died for his faith, he is considered as a martyr in the church. So here is a possibility for me to explain what a martyr in the orthodox church is a martyr in the orthodox church is is different from how islam for example understands a martyr so for example in islamic view a martyr is someone that's more like a militaristic right if, if he fights and dies for islam in a military battlefield he is a martyr in the orthodox understanding this is not so he will be an ethno martyr he will be you know, he will be defending his faith militarily. It's not a denial of that. But a martyr is someone who is persecuted and is someone who dies, specifically dies for their faith. Someone who dies for their faith. Um, it's 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 off topic, but some people say um, the last Roman emperor was a martyr. Um, I'm sorry, but in the Orthodox Christian sense, he cannot be because he did not die because of his faith. Now, there is an emperor, a Roman emperor, after him that did die because of, fate, of his fate, who is my patron saint, and he's Saint David Komnenos. Now, he did actually die for his fate, um, because he was tortured, because he wouldn't convert to uh, Islam, and because he didn't convert to Islam, he got tortured and was killed as a result. So, he is he's considered as a martyr. Um, so, there's a trend. So, that's what a martyr means, and Saint Tuna is a martyr. Uh, you might ask, what is the Holy Fire miracle exactly? Well, this is from Orthodox Wiki, if I remember correctly. The, the Holy Fire, uh, which, which, which means Holy Light, is a miracle that occurs every year at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem on Holy Saturday, the day preceding Pascha. It is considered by many to be the longest attested annual miracle in the Christian world, though the event has only been documented consecutively since uh 1106 in many orthodox countries around the world the event is televised live the fire is also said to be spontaneously light other lamps and candles around the church pilgrims say the holy fire will not burn hair faces etc in the first 33 minutes after it is ignited just a side note for those who don't know 33 minutes there is a symbolism there because uh, christ died when he was 33 years old uh, before entering the Lord's tomb, the patriarch or presiding archbishop is inspected by Israeli authorities to prove that he does not carry the technical means to light the fire. This investigation used to be carried out by Turkish soldiers. So, um, I'm not going to be making an argument, oh, is this real? I, I do believe the Holy Fire miracle is indeed real. I, fully, I think if you're Orthodox, you kind of have to believe in it, to be honest. Um, I'm not going to make an argument. I'm just going to say that uh, these inspections... One of the funny things about the Holy Fire Miracle and, and relating to the story of St. Uh, Tuna 
if you look into his story, you will realize that his story is particularly long because there was a dispute between Greeks and Armenians at the time about the Holy Fire Miracles, and the Armenians tried to replicate the Holy Fire Miracles. Now, spoiler alert, they completely failed. Why? Because the Armenians, when I say Armenians, I'm referring to the quote-unquote Armenian Apostolic Church. The Armenian Apostolic Church is what we will call today Oriental Orthodox. They're part of the, or the anti chalcedonian Communion that reject the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451. And so they're not part of the Orthodox Church in our view. And <laughs> I just think it's funny that they try to replicate it and they couldn't do it. And Roman Catholics in history have tried to replicate it. They couldn't do it either. Only the Orthodox Christians have consecutively successfully done the Holy Fire Miracle, which I think is quite interesting. Again, if you're interested in this topic, feel free to just research on it on its own. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, there's obviously some accounts of people trying to dis dis discredit it. Um, but when you look into it in detail, you will find some really interesting stuff, I think. Moving on, I want to talk about St. Nicholas Karamanos. His feast day is December 5th. He was a Karamanlı um, and he lived in Izmir. And in, in his life, he was uh, brought before a Muslim judge, a Kadı, on the ac accusation that he wanted to be a Muslim. So there's different accounts of this. One of the claims is that he apparently was angry and in a sarcastic manner, he said, I'll become a Muslim. It, it's the context not well known but there's some claims for that some other claims is that just people just like just said he wants to be a muslim to really make him muslim because they wanted him to be muslim you know there's multiple accounts that we don't know fully but what we do know fully is that he was accused that he wanted to be muslim supposedly and in front of the Qadr, he denies it. He says, God forbid I shall ever deny my maker and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true God who will judge the living and the dead and will give to each according to his deeds. And upon hearing this, he is ordered to be beaten. He refused. He was offered to con convert to Islam during his beating. So basically the offer was, if you convert to Islam, I will stop beating you. I will give you all of these good things. You know, just accept Islam. And he refused in each instance. And the punishments grew. He was sent to jail. He was, he was ordered to not be allowed to eat nor drink. And he was to be beaten twice per day. Uh, pretty brutal, right? Pretty brutal way to torture him. And he was finally sentenced to be hanged in the year 1657, where he died as a martyr to the faint, St. Nicholas Karamanos. St. Ahmed the Calligrapher. Uh, oh, I also want to add before I move on with St. Nicholas Karamanos. So there are some accounts where he says one of the things that he says um, is that I will not be a Muslim as an outburst that he makes. Some translations, some accounts say I will not become a Turk. Now, that might be confusing, right? They must say, I thought this guy was a Turk, but now he says I won't be a Turk. So especially in the Greek Orthodox mindset, First of all, I would like to explain that this, it's highly possible that, it was, that what he said was, I will not become a Muslim. It was translated this way because it is possible that it was translated this way, mainly because in the Greek Orthodox mindset, heresies, well, religious faiths in general were associated with the central person behind it or, or it was associated with the ethnicity uh, that the faith was generally promoted. So for example, um, Orthodox Greeks, when they said you are a Greek in a religious context, they will refer to them. They will say they will basically mean that you are a, you are a Greek pagan, right? You are a Hellen. That means you are a Greek pagan. Um, that's one of the things. If you look at the heresies that are named, I mean, the religious faith itself is named after Christ, right? But if you named look at the heresies, they're named after um, the persons promulgating the heresies. Nestorianism, uh, Nestorius promulgated the heresy of Nestorianism. Apollinarius promulgate the heresy of Apollinarianism, Eunomius promulgate the heresy of Eunomianism, Arianism, right, promulgated by Arius. You see a consistent trend. And then you you see the term Armenians being used in ecclesiastical context, for example, in debates of leavened or unleavened bread. Armenians use unleavened bread. We will not be like the Armenians. 
they're not disparaging the Armenian ethnicity, they're disparaging the Armenian church's practices by, do, by doing that. So that's why you have, for Islam, you, you, you see them refer to Muslims as not as Muslims, but rather Muhammadans, right? Uh, and by their ethnicity, like Arab or Turk, right? So this might be one of those instances where Turk and Muslim were synonymous, not in, in terms of substance, right? They will still probably, obviously, make a distinction between ethnicity. I mean, it will be just silly if St. Nicholas just said, I will not be a Turk. I mean, is he going to be ethnically transmogrified? No, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Uh, so he's obviously referring to, I will, I will just not become a Muslim. And so that will explain one of those things that happen. If you look into the story, I just want to explain before, you know, you just get confused. Try to look after you, right? Um, Saint Ahmed the Calligrapher, uh, one of the most well-known Turkish saints, Saint uh, Ahmed the Calligrapher, lived in Constantinople during the 1600s and was an official in the Ottoman Turkish government before his conversion. Ahmed owned a Russian concubine whom he allowed to attend one of the Greek Orthodox churches in Constantinople. In time, Ahmed began to, began to notice that when his Russian concubine returned from church, she was far more gracious and loving than she was before going. Intrigued by this, Ahmed obtained permission to attend the ecumenical patriarch celebration of the Divine Liturgy in Constantinople. Due to his status and identity, his request was not refused and he was given a special place when he attended. During the Divine Liturgy, Ahmed saw that when the ecumenical patriarch blessed the faithful with his trikiri and dikiri, his uh, the this is the trikiri and dikiri. The 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 one that on his right hand is the trikiri. The one that has dikiri, the three d. You know. Uh, <clears throat> so when the ecumenical patriarch blessed the faithful with his trikiri and dikiri, his fingers beamed light onto the heads of the faithful Christians, but not his own. Amazed by this miracle, Ahmed requested and received holy baptism. Thereafter, Ahmed lived a secret Christian life. We do not know what happened in this period after his baptism, but it is not unlikely that Ahmed's love for the concubine who had led him indirectly to the Orthodox faith blossomed. It is also likely that the future martyr met with a spiritual father to learn more about the faith he had adopted and the Lord he now served. Whatever happened during this period, one day a group of arguing officials asked Ahmed for his opinion of their dispute to which he replied that the Christian faith is better. And it says in parenthesis, no doubt their argument. There's multiple accounts I will explain when I'm done with this. Are you a Christian? An officer smilingly asked the saint. Yes, I am a Christian. The saint replied slowly, peacefully, and clearly, smiling at the officer who had questioned him, who later on tortured him. Because Saint Ahmed endured all the tortures, he was then subjected uh, to by his erstwhile compatriots and was martyred on May 3rd, 1682 may 3rd is his feast day as well so in regards to the dispute there's multiple accounts one of the accounts for example um was what's the best thing in life right so they were kind of arguing what's the best thing in life and one of them was answering oh it's xyz is the best thing in life one of the answer oh food food is the best thing in this life right they were giving all of these material answer materialistic answers and Saint Ahmed just shut up when they asked him, you know what the best thing in life is? The faith, the worship, the liturgy of the Orthodox Christians. That's the best thing in this life. And that's what he responded. So that's one of the accounts. Um, if you again look at research his life, you will inevitably come across this account. Um, but again, one thing is certain. He was asked, what's the best thing? He gave the answer that the answer was holy orthodoxy and he died and was martyred for his faith in in orthodox christianity and yeah and uh this is from mark martyrgo's book i translate this from turkish to english um uh, i'm not a good translator uh i will say this first but the, the apologetic really interesting man i wanted to uh mention this so the concubine, right? So Saint Ahmed, he was he wondered about the Christian faith because, you know, his his concubine came, just radiating with grace every time she came from liturgy, and he just wondered, you know, what 
Like, why did this even happen? And so, they were talking, about, and she was explaining her fate to him. And this is the way she explained the fate. And I, again, I think it's very interesting, and I will explain why it's interesting. She says, our fate is a living fate. For us Christians, the Messiah Christ is our God. He is the Son of God. He came down to us and became man to save us from our sins. The world itself could not count the miracles that he did. And if you want to know about the greatest miracle, it is his suffering and death on the cross by the hands of the Jews just because he loved us. His resurrection on the third day is the most important event in human history. In the lives of the Orthodox Christians, through the power of Christ, miracles still happen to this day. With Christ, all is possible. Now, what's interesting about this apologetic is that a lot of the stuff that she uses as her argument is from Scripture, it's from the Church Fathers, and it's from the liturgy. Now, first of all, this concubine, what an amazing woman. She even knows more than uh, most uh, Orthodox women that I met. I mean, <laughs> that's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but um, so, for example... Uh, he came down to us and became man to save us from our sins. That's from the Nicene Creed, paraphrasing from the Nicene Creed. The world itself could not count the miracles that he did. Uh, she's paraphrasing the last part of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John basically says this at the same time. Uh, and just in general, right, with Christ, all things, all is possible. Paraphrasing Christ's word, with God, all things are possible. And so... I heard it well it just struck like it was just crazy to me that she just paraphrased the scripture the liturgy the all of these things and it's a testament to i believe the power of the of the liturgy the power of the lives of the saints the power of scripture and all of that kind of stuff uh, so i wanted to add it in here and this is one of the things that convinced saint ahmed it's not just the miracle just the all oh, crazy event it's his research into orthodoxy. It's him looking into orthodoxy, realizing that it makes so much sense and that helped him convert to the orthodox faith. This is one of my favorite saints, favorite Turkish saints, personally. Um, this is Saint Musa Ahmetoğlu, or you can say Ahmetoğlu Musa, uh, also known as Monk Daniel. His feast day is November 18th. This is November 5th in the old calendar. He was the son of the judge of Paramifia, and he was also a pasha. His life is very connected with the life of St. Anastasius of Epirus, and their feast days are on the same day. And his conversion to Christianity is due to St. Anastasius. And he founded the church of St. Anastasius, the new martyr in Paramifia, in his honor. So if you want to visit a church built by a Turkish Orthodox Christian, go to Paramifia and visit St. Anastasius, the new martyr in Paramifia. That is a church built by a Turkish Orthodox Christian saint. Uh, what, a, what a great blessing. Uh, and I will be reading to you the, the life of holy new martyr St. Anastasius of Paramifia because although it's the life of St. Anastasius, Saint Daniel is basically another main character in this <laughs> in this in this life of Saint Anastasius. So Saint Anastasius and his sister Maria were Greek peasants living in Paramifia, Epirus under Ottoman rule, who were orphaned from a young age. One day, two Albanian Muslim soldiers of the local judge Ahmed Pasha, one of which was his son named Musa, came through their village as they were out with others gathering crops. Musa was struck by the beauty of M Maria and tried to seize her in his lust. But Anastasius and his friends threw himself at the Albanians and fought him off long enough for his sister to escape. In, re in revenge for this, Anastasius and his friends were arrested and brought before the judge, who, impressed by his courage, attempted to convert him to Islam by many means, threats, beatings, and offers of worldly honor. But Anastasius held firm in his orthodox Christian faith and was cast into prison. Meanwhile, his friends were beaten and made to pay a heavy fine and was released. When Anastasius was again brought before the judge, more flatteries, offers, and threats were made for him to convert to Islam. But Anastasius continued to remain firm in his faith, expressing his preference to die an Orthodox Christian rather than become a Muslim. The Albanian Turkish soldiers also slandered him by saying he expressed a desire to become a Muslim, but was not denying his promise. 
Anastasius firmly denied such an absurd accusation and went further to express his desire to die 10,000 deaths rather than to convert to Islam. For this, Anastasius was again cast into jail and after being beaten, they placed his legs in the infamous leg stocks which caused indescribable pain. At the advice of a afraid friend, the judge decided to make an offer to Anastasius he thought he could not refuse. So the next day, Anastasius stood before the judge, who was now gentler in his approach, and promised him gifts and riches if he converted to Islam, and, and even offered to make him a son and give him one of his daughters to marry. Anastasius, however, will have none of this, but said, I have good things in heaven that are not like yours, but incomparably better, more valuable and eternal. In no way will I accept yours which are corruptible and vain only to lose those which are eternal. Therefore, in no way, God forbid, will I deny my fate. With this, he was once again sent to prison. A witness of the courage of Anastasius was a man named Musa, the son of Mehmed Pasha, who was astonished how these Orthodox Christians shunned earthly goods and pleasures and accepted instead torture and death. So he visited Anastasius in prison to inquire about this. When he arrived at his cell, Musa beheld Anastasius with two figures standing next to him. He therefore asked Anastasius who they were, and Anastasius responded, All Orthodox Christians always have a guardian angel from God. One was sent to visit me because of the martyrdom I am undergoing. These angels protect us here in this world as long as we are alive. After we die, they receive our souls in paradise. Musa asked, Don't we Muslims have such a guardian? Anastasius replied, You Muslims and all other nations have only one angel for each nation, and that's only because of God's mercy who prevents you from doing wrong. So he's not saying that, Oh, you're the true failure, ecumenistic Vatican II garbage. Um, he's basically saying God loves them. He has a garden angel for them because he wants to protect them, even though they're part of the wrong faith. So no ecumenism here. Sorry. No, uh, no nonsense. Musa then asked him, why he did not accept all the wonderful gifts his father's father offered him. To this, Anastasius replied as he did before, speaking of the eternal heavenly gifts in comparison to those that are transient. He continued to tell him about Jesus Christ and the faith of Orthodox Christians, while he criticized Muhammad and the deceptions of all those who follow his teachings. All this convinced Musa of the truth of Orthodox Christianity, and he fell on his knees and expressed a desire to become an Orthodox Christian. Anastasius advised, however, to secretly hold his faith, for if he converted and his father found out, many Orthodox Christians will die. But if he is found worthy, God will find a way to fulfill his desire. So this is something that I would recommend to all people who want to be Orthodox Christian but just can't. Follow St. Anastasius' advice. Be patient. Be patient. God will deliver you eventually. You shall be patient you will fulfill your desire and what you want will eventually come to you. It's, it, just, it doesn't have to be instantaneous and everything does not have to be instantaneous. You can always wait, be patient and trust in God. After a few days, the judge vainly tried to persuade Anastasius to deny his faith and accept Islam one more time. After Anastasius refused, he was sentenced to be beheaded. He was taken by executioners to a monastery nearby and beheaded on November 18th 1750. For three days, his body remained unburied, and at night a bright light shined on his body, which he, the judge ordered not to be touched. On the third night, the judge saw Anastasius in a dream, which must have frightened him, since it caused him to immediately relent and allow the monks to, of the monastery to bury the body. Meanwhile, Musa's life had changed dramatically, and he prayed for the opportunity to be baptized. Instead of spending his time in life's pleasures, he devoted his life to prayer. This new conduct and attitude disturbed his father. So one day an invitation came from the sister of Ahmed Pasha, three days journey away to invite him to attend the marriage of her son. Ahmed secretly accepted the invitation, but in his son Musa's name, hoping the wedding festivities will turn him around. Thus accompanied by a number of servants, Musa did his duty and set off to attend the, the wedding. Having a hard time speaking here. On his way to the wedding, Musa deliberately took the route that will take him near the monastery where Anastasius was buried. When he arrived there, he pretended to be ill and wished to spend the night at the monastery before continuing his journey. The monks of the monastery received them and gave them generous hospitality. 
That night, while everyone was sleeping, Musa quietly went to the abbot and asked him to open the church so he might enter. Thinking perhaps Musa was up to no good, the abbot, the abbot was a bit frightened, but Musa reassured him that he had nothing to fear. The abbot escorted Musa to the church and arriving at the tomb of St. Anastasius, he did his cross and knelt before it to the astonishment of the abbot. He remained there for some time praying, asking Anastasius to fulfill his promise to have him baptized. Anastasius appeared to him in a vision saying that he will help him. Musa therefore got up and turning to the abbot, he asked to be baptized. Fearing the wrath of Musa's father, the abbot said to him, God will provide the way as he wills. The next day Musa went to the wedding, but hardly participated in the festivities. From there he left and went to the city of Patras, where he took a ship to Venice carrying with him introductory letters to the Orthodox Christian merchants of the city together with an icon of the Theotokos. He did this in order to be baptized without fear of reprisal by the Turks. In Venice, Musa was received by, by a pious Orthodox merchant who hailed from Yonin, uh, Yonanina, Yonina, yeah, that's probably it. This merchant became Musa's godparent when he was baptized in the church of St. George, at which time he took the name Dimitrios. He then spent time in Venice, where he learned Greek and the Orthodox faith. Later, certain Orthodox Christians decided to go to Ker Kerkuk, Corfu, on a pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Spiridon, and they were joined by Demetrius. There, Demetrius met Abbot Chrysantos, who furthered his education in Christ. After becoming a novice, Demetrius was tonsured as a monk and took the name Daniel. Having spent some time in the monastery, a desire grew within him to imitate Anastasius and became a martyr. So he left Kerkuk and went to the Peloponnese, where he decided to give his life for Christ. However, when he arrived there and expressed his desire to the Christians of that area, they dissuaded him from doing so, fearing the repercussions they will face. He thus took sail to Constantinople where he visited Patriarch Sophronius of Jerusalem, who advised him rather to fast and pray fervently with tears to enable him to be illumined to do his work. Thus he dissuaded him from martyrdom, knowing that the conversion of such a prominent Albanian Turk would, if it were known, lead to retaliation against Christians. St. Daniel returned to Kerkuk, where he founded the church in honor of St. Anastasius and reposed in peace as an Orthodox monk. This is the, this is the life of St. Uh, Daniel, St. Ahmed, uh, Musa Ahmetoğlu. And he's... I believe one like a or even amongst Turkish saints, he's one of the most underrated saints. Um, because when I look at his life, it's very easy to see that, like he he he's one of those holy people that's very genuine, but he makes like these like silly mistakes. Like one of the things that he wants to do is that he wants to follow Saint Anastasia's foot, footsteps, very well intentioned. But he didn't think that doing that will probably make it worse for Christians. And when it was that known to him, he took it in humility and realized, I should be doing this. I mean, I should just like just not do this because I will be hurting my brothers. I can't do this. And just in general, like the way like the way he came to the monastery, try to reassure the abbot, please open the church and just start praying. And I can imagine like the way he probably did the sign of the cross and the prostrations, he probably did not do a good job like as a pro, but we don't care about that. It's his heart, it's his faith, it's his love for Christ, it's his love for the Christian faith that I believe is amazing. And um, St. Anastasius is amazing with the saint he converted is just as amazing, in my opinion. Um, and finally, the final Turkish Orthodox saint that I'm going to be covering in this video is going to be Saint Constantine of Mytilene, the, Mid the Midili Islands. The Midili Island, not islands. What am I talking about? His feast day is on June 2nd. He was born in the island of Mytilene to Muslim Turk parents, and his Turkish name is not known. Uh, so we know his Christian name. And um, one of the interesting things about, not St. Constantine, but it reminded me, St. Ahmed is that Ahmed is now 
like a Christian name now. Like if you, theoretically speaking, if you were to be if you were to be baptized and take upon a Christian name, you can take Ahmed as a name now. Um, you can baptize yourself with the name Ahmed and be baptized with that. And I think that's, uh, I just think that's interesting. I think that's, I mean, if we had Orthodox Christian Turkey like Turkish Orthodox Christians converting. They could theoretically just be converted as Ahmed. <laughs> um, I don't think. I mean, I'm not laughing as because if I'm just, I think it's just you know amazing. And um, but yeah, let's let's finish this video with the life of Saint Constantine of Mytilene. So again, this is another long life of the saint. And again, I'm going to be reading this. Sorry if I make mistakes, but you know, uh, I'm not a perfect reader. St. Constantine, whose Muslim name we do not know, was born to Muslim parents on the island of Mytilene in the village of Silem S <laughs> I'm so stupid. Silametopon. His father died when he was quite young. His mother, therefore, saw to his Muslim upbringing. At the age of 15, Constantine was afflicted with smallpox, which caused him to go blind. Taking pity on him, a pious Orthodox Christian woman asked Constantine's mother for permission to take him to a nearby Orthodox shrine with holy water. The woman washed Constantine in the sacred font and he was cured. Shortly after, his mother remarried and moved to the city of uh, Manisa in Asia Minor. His stepfather, despite being a Muslim, proved to be a drunk and beat him regularly. Consequently, Constantine left home with his three brothers. His and his oldest brother moved to the city of Izmir where they opened, opened a vegetable store. Constantine as assisted his brother and was engaged in delivering vegetables. This duty often took him to the headquarters of Metropolitan Kalinikos II, where he would often stop and listen to religious readings. Slowly but surely, his love for the Christian message he heard grew. In addition, he made friends with two Christian young men with whom he grew very close. At that time, plague was rampant in Izmir. All three young men went to the church of St. George and lit candles, praying for deliverance. But a strange thing then happened. Saved from the plague, Constantine nevertheless turned and began living a, a very dissolute life. But he soon came to his senses and left for the holy mountain. Constantine first stopped at New Skit. His arrival on the holy mountain caused quite a stir because he was a Muslim. The fathers of the monastery of St. Paul were reluctant to accept him fearing repercussions from the Muslim authorities, and passed him on to the monastery of the great Lavra, where he was also refused admission. From there, Constantine went on to the skit of St. Anna, where he met and spoke with Father Chrysanthos. Leaving St. Anna, Constantine headed back to the great Lavra, but on the way he changed his mind and went instead to the fathers at Kavsokalvia. I couldn't say that. I am, I'm not picky, I'm going to try to say it properly as much as I can. Kavsokaliva. Yeah, that's, that's it, Kavsukaliva. There, a certain monk named Gabriel advised him to return to Great Lavra, but the fathers of Great Lavra were still afraid to allow him to stay with them. So Constantine was forced to return to Kavsukaliva. There he made Patriarch Gregory V, who retired to the Holy Mountain between his three tenures as Patriarch. Patriarch Gregory spoke with Constantine to test his sincerity in wishing to become a Christian. The Patriarch said to him, why did you, young man, come to us, the despised ones? What do you seek from us, who have nothing as you can see? Are we not the loveliest of nations, whereas you have the kingdom and the glory and enjoy all the world? Why are you not satisfied when so many desire to enjoy the temporary life with, which, which you seem to despise? Come to your senses. These words ca caused Constantine to break out in tears. Seeing this, the patriarch realized his sincerity. So he said to him, Soon I will come to Kavsukaliva and I will baptize you. Only prepare yourself, keep yourself pure, and above all, tell no one. Constantine returned to Kavsukaliva and waited, but he soon became unhappy over the delay in his baptism. His elder, seeing him in this condition, was convinced of his sincerity and readiness and baptized him, giving him the name of Constantine. After a short time, Constantine went to Iveron Monastery to venerate the miraculous icon of Panagia Portaitisa, keeper of the portal, and then went on to the skit of St. John the Forerunner, where he heard there was an experienced elder who had prepared many for martyrdom. In addition, there were in the skit newly arrived relics of neo-martyrs. 
Constantine spent time with the Elder and returned with a downca downcast face to his own Elder, Kafsukhalifa. When asked why he appeared so, Constantine replied, There is no other reason for my downcast, downcast look except that I reverenced the relics of the Neo-Martyrs and my soul became completely attached to them. My mind became captive as you see me now and the desire to imitate their deeds occupied my spirit. Hearing this, the Elder glorified God and said, Blessed be God, my son, if this is to your liking, only God the Omnipotent will initiate and end what you will do. He then invited a spiritual father to begin Constantine's preparation for his martyrdom. Constantine began fasting for 40 days, eating only once a day. A short time later, Constantine decided to return to Manisa in Asia Minor, where he had intended to visit his sister, whom he hoped to convince to share his faith in Jesus Christ by having her baptized. Meanwhile, Constantine went to his spiritual father for confession and was then given permission to fulfill his desire to become martyr. Secretly carrying the letters of recommendation for Patriarch Gregory V, Constantine sailed to Kidonis, but there were no ships sailing immediately from Izmir, his destination. In the interval, in order to live, Constantine sold raisins and other dry fruits on the streets until a ship could be found. One day, a servant of the Aga, Ah, Ah, Aga, I'm sitting, Aga, Ah recognized him and asked an Orthodox Christian standing nearby, asking, Who is that man? I don't know, was the answer. He recently came here and I don't know from where. That night, the Orthodox Christian sought out Constantine and told him, I heard this Muslim saying that he knows you and you are a Muslim. Is it true or is he trying to undermine you? God forbid, was Constantine's reply. I am an Orthodox Christian. That night, unable to sleep, Constantine decided to leave in the morning. He found a ship which was sailing to Izmir and boarded it, but he was observed by the, by the same Muslim who had recognized him and had him put off the ship and taken to the Aga. Ah, I can see it, bro. It's Turkish, but I'm sorry. The latter asked Constantine who he was and how he got there. <clears throat> To this Constantine replied, I have come from afar and I am on my way to Anatolia. I am an Orthodox Christian and my name is Constantine. The I replied, you are lying to me. What would you say if someone can be found who knows you as a Muslim? What will you say? At that moment, the Muslim appeared and said to Constantine, don't I know that you are a brother of a Muslim with whom you were in the vegetable business in Izmir? How can you lie to us? To this Constantine responded boldly and in a loud voice, I was a Muslim, like you impious and lawless ones. But because I was enlightened by God and was informed that the Muslim faith is transient and only the Orthodox faith is true and pure, and because I recognized my own interest, I became an Orthodox Christian to gain eternal life. Upon hearing this, the A ordered Constantine beaten and imprisoned until he came to his senses. He then wrote to the A of Mosconesia, asking him to come immediately because he was needed. When the Ah arrived a few days later, he was told of Constantine, who was brought before him, questioned once more, and urged to return to Islam. Constantine refused and was beaten severely and thrown back into prison, where many Christians visited him in secret. Constantine asked them to pray for him, so he will die a fateful death. Meanwhile, a torturer who had tortured Neomartyr George began applying the same painful measures to Constantine. He devised an iron hat, which was heated and placed on Constantine's head. Then lead balls wrapped in a band were pressed up against his temples, almost causing his eyes to pop out of his head. A few days later, Constantine was brought before the Vali and was asked if he had changed his mind. He answered, You are truly tyrants, wild animals, and not rational human beings. But untie me and I will show you who I am. Constantine was untied and immediately he made the sign of the cross and said in a loud voice, Did you see who I am? So please don't think that I will change my mind and become like you. Whereupon the Ah of Mosconesia became very angry, took out his knife, and cut Constantine crosswise on his chest. At that moment, Constantine's clothes tore and a gold cross appeared on his chest. This infuriated the Muslims present even more. They fell upon him and beat him. They then enclosed his feet in stocks and bound him with chains. At night, he was suspended from the ceiling. Here's a fresco depicting this event. The Ah finally realized that Constantine could not be forced or persuaded to deny his Orthodox Christian faith. He decided to send him to Constantinople, to the admiral of the fleet who questioned Constantine when he arrived. 
but Constantine remained steadfast and was sentenced by the admiral to be incarcerated in a bathhouse. There he was visited by a spiritual father who said to him, To witness is a good thing, Constantine, but think well on how painful the tortures of the infidel Muslims are. Perhaps you will weaken later. If you wish, we can see to your release. Constantine, however, replied, Holy Father, look at me. He then pushed aside his tunic and revealed his secret parts and ties from the many tortures he had undergone. There were huge lacerations of both sides of his legs, both in front of his body and behind, which must have caused him unim unimaginable pain. Seeing this, the spiritual father reverenced Constantine, who said to him, See that no one dares give any money to free me, because in a few days my struggles to end as the Theotokos has revealed to me. But please give His All Holiness, Lord Gregory, my gre greetings. He knows who I am, and ask Him to pray for me. The next morning Constantine was in interrogated again, but remained faithful to Jesus Christ and was beaten once more. At the third questioning, the approach was different. Constantine was offered a high position and riches, but to this he said, Ah, if you too were to come to recognize the interest of your soul, you will be an Orthodox Christian. In response, the Ah hit Constantine on the chin, ordered him out of the room, and immediately sentenced him to death. His ordeal had lasted 40 long days. After he was hanged, Constantine was buried in a Muslim graveyard because he had been circumcised, but more importantly, the Muslims did it so that he will be inaccessible to Orthodox Christians who will wish to recover his body and honor him. Thus Constantine the Hagarin from Silometopon, Mytilene sacrificed his Mytilene, sacrificed his life in the city of Constantinople for the love of Jesus Christ on June second in the year eighteen nineteen. And I want to finish this with the Apolitikon in the fourth tone. I oh, can't chant properly, so I'll just read it. A light bearer has risen in the Church of Christ. The memory of your contest has filled her with light. Seal of the martyrs, glorious Constantine. Release from the deceit the offspring of Hagar and richly illumine the souls of the faithful, those who celebrate your memory, ever blessed one. And so this will be the final uh, Turkish Orthodox saint whose life I will be covering in this video. This was quite a long video, but, you know, I'm covering an entire history. It's not going to be, it's not supposed to be short, right? And this will be it. So I want to finalize this video by, by just finalizing with this. First of all, there's no point in attacking Turks in this video uh, because these tortures have been done by everyone. Everyone has done this to Christians. Everyone has persecuted Christians. This is nothing new. That's number one. Number two, the, the Turkish people have a considerable history with Christianity. Unfortunately, this is hidden due to ulterior geopolitical motives. I know those three political motives as, as a Turk myself. I see the news every day. I see the bile and the vomit produced by certain uh, political people. I mean, I've heard a political pundit, what an idiot he is, who said the Greek Orthodox Church is anti-Turkish. If the Greek Orthodox Church was anti-Turkish, why does it have Turkish Orthodox saints? You blittering idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about. You have no information. You're a liar. You're a slander. You're no different than all of these monsters and dogs and animals that have tortured all of these Christians. The spirit behind this is not a spirit exclusive to Turkish people, exclusive to the average Turk or whatever, but it's... It's an evil spirit, nevertheless. And I want to finalize this by saying, look, this will be bold, but Turks can be Christian just as much as they can be Muslim. No doubt. The Turks have history with a bunch of religions, really. I mean, even with Judaism. But they have a lot of experience with the Orthodox Christian faith. We have, or saints had I mean, this is kind of going to be, I, I don't care. Or saints, like St. Saint Alexander Nevsky, his pretty much best friend was a Turk who converted to Christianity. And I believe he was the head of, um, he was the head of the Golden Horde for a year. I forgot his name, but he converted to Christianity. St. Alex Alexander Nevsky, you can look up his knife, life, right? And it doesn't hurt 
knowing about this. It doesn't hurt knowing about the history of of all of this stuff. And this is a kind of like a hidden part of history that I kind of just wanted to uncover and show it to people. Kind of surprise you, kind of give you more information about Turkish people, kind of break this this stupid understanding that Turkish people only have to be Muslim, whatever. That is not absolutely not true. It is natural for a Turk to be Christian as much to be a Christian. It is natural for anyone, for anyone to be an Orthodox Christian. And he, why? Is it because they were grown by it? No, it's because Orthodox Christianity is the true faith. It's the true faith of the apostles. It's the true faith uh, that describes the nature of God. It's the true faith, period. That is why it's natural for everyone to be Orthodox Christians. That's what I want to finalize this video with. I'll be putting the uh, sources in the description. Descriptions in the sources below. I'll be putting the source in the description below. If you like my content, if you like this video, if you like me, hey, you can check out my other contents. You can subscribe to me, like this video, share this with your friend. Hey, if you have a Turkish friend that's interested in Christianity, let them know about this video. Maybe, maybe they will appreciate it. And um, thank you all for watching this video. I will see you guys in the next video that I will be inevitably making. God be with you all.